here today to talk a bit about the book of lies. Um, I'm going to start off with just kind of simple, you know, what is this book? Uh, what is its sort of significance in the in the Crowley timeline? Um, this is something that came up uh, in between uh, Crowley's experiences that uh, he wrote about in Libra 418 and writing uh, Book Four, which was kind of his you know, magic and theory and practice as guide to uh, to magic. So a lot of the ideas that um, show up in that in Book Four are sort of prefigured in the Book of Lies, and it's sort of a, like an early manual for the Lima essentially. In a way of ratifying the idea of the Holy Guardian Angel in the Abyss, because now Crowley's kind of been across, he's had his annihilation of the ego experience, and he's trying to express that in a certain way. But at the same time, he's also drawing on a lot of things that he kind of um, was part of his system before he even had his Holy Guardian Angel experience, before 1904, when he was working at writing in Buddhism, and he had, uh, like, his two equals zero essay, for example, is very, like, it underlies the whole structure of this book. Um, and it's significant, too, to note that the commentary on it, the comments that explain the poems, wasn't written until, you know, around a decade later, roughly. So uh, the original text would have just been the poems in themselves without, without the explanation, which would probably be a lot harder to understand. Yes. Hard to understand as it is. Um, in this sense that he kind of, like, Crowley, because, you know, early on, it's not just the Buddhism thing and the ontology, because this is, like, in, a, in essence, the Book of Lies is an expression of philemic ontology or, like, the, the understanding of being and uh, that, the role that that plays in Thelema, but it's also his a sort of a talismanic thing. Um, in the Book of Thoth lecture, we talked about how uh, these, uh, the images of the cards kind of form, like, an algebra of initiation. They're expressions of other ideas of numbers, so it takes it into an abstract kind of place. In the Book of Lies, Crowley is taking the abstract ideas of these numbers from 1 to 91 and, uh, well, 0 to 91, and he's expressing them in, um, in specific terms, so it's, it's a kind of a poetic expression of these specific forms, and, and of course, uh, Crowley's first writings were poetry. I mean, that was initially, kind of before he was known as an occultist, he was a poet, and so this is, in a way, him drawing back on things that he was doing before his occult work really kind of took off took him into the, like, the next level and he attained these greater degrees of initiation and now he's, he's drawing back on that to uh, find a way of expressing the ideas that he encountered while trying to cross the abyss in uh, something that will not really be a guide but um, be a way that people can kind of start to understand what he means by the experience. And this is why I always uh, say that this is a really good book for people who are just starting out with Ceremonial Magic at the Lima because if you, like, you won't understand it right away, but if you stop and look up all the things that you don't understand, then by the time that you're through it, then you'll know quite a bit and have a good foundation for looking at Crowley's other books. Um, the main thing that makes this different than a lot of the kind of, um, a lot of the more instructional books, or even things like uh, Libra 418 and the Paris Working, is that it's intimately connected to Crowley's own life. Uh, the whole idea of crossing the abyss is even like the highest, most abstract, most pure concept idea has to be reconciled with the lowest, basis, most mundane idea. So sometimes he's got almost essays and philosophy in there, sometimes he's got little riddles or real, little poems, and sometimes he's talking about like restaurants he likes to eat at, or his girlfriend at the time. And he, like in that way he's kind of trying to resolve all these different planes of, of one person. Because uh, the whole crossing the abyss thing is about the destruction of Aleister Crowley in a sense. And so all those aspects of his personality and thinking have to be kind of resolved into a single point that can be annihilated in that, in that crossing. In a lot of ways, uh, I like to think this book is like a moratorium on Crowley after Crowley, or Crowley kind of like put it, closing the book on himself as a personality in a way and getting ready to experience uh, his Magus initiation, which came shortly after that, which kind of expressed itself in a lot of the same ways. I mean, you can see the expression of the Magus initiation sort of uh, echoed in the Book of Lies, because that's where, like I said, he's trying to resolve his mundane life with his higher life, and that was uh, a period of time in which um, literally like his, his social life was the sort of theater of operations for that initiation to take place, and he writes about that a lot in his confessions, and that's where you see like the smallest thing becomes huge and everything takes on its own significance. Um, so. A big part of this is, uh, you have to understand that this comes out of Crowley's formal education a lot, uh, particularly where he gets into his philosophical concepts and, concepts and stuff like that. Uh, Crowley, he does cite a lot of works in the Book of Lies, but he doesn't cite philosophers as much as maybe he necessarily draws their ideas. Like, there's a lot of Hegel in here, there's a lot of Spinoza in here. A lot of the, the German ontologists kind of, like, created a language, which he sort of... Um, 
he doesn't totally thrust it aside, but he tries to create a new way of understanding that in the Book of Lies. Um, and in a sense, he does this uh, through three figures that show up um, in the text itself, which are sort of referred to respectively as um, that, it, and I. And there are sort of different subcategories of, of these um, and concepts beyond the, these. But uh, in, in a sense, when he's trying to get into the, the meat of the ontology uh, of the philosophy that's being expressed here, those are, those are his ideas that he's working on. Um, in a sense, uh, the first kind of big hurdle to get a person's head around is that um, the Book of Lies has a conception of the universe which begins from a positive idea of nothing, or nothingness. What do we mean by positive is that if we usually uh, try to conceive of nothingness, we have to conceive it of it as a negation of another thing. And this sense of nothing, that sort of eye that comes at the beginning of the Naples arrangement of the Tree of Life, and that initial source to project all of manifestation that comes out into the Malkuth and the kingdom and the manifest physical world begins with nothingness, but it's a creative nothingness that produces something, not uh, taking something that already existed and taking it away, essentially. So that, that in itself is kind of a brain twister, but that moves us pretty uh, positively into the idea that Crowley's trying to express when he talks about that, uh, which he does in a few of the different poems here. Um, he defines literally that as... Um, sort of the becoming of nothingness, but usually he's trying to describe it in sort of contradictory terms. Um, what we're to understand about the abyss, according to Crowley, is that um, it's sort of the line above which uh, no contradiction is possible. Uh, all opposites are resolved into themselves, and uh, what we have is um, a sense of reality without difference, without separateness, and where everything is fundamentally connected, which is closer to the truth. I mean, that's the meaning behind the title, The Book of Lies, is anything that can be said about anything is necessarily false because it implies a distinction between one thing and another thing, and that implication is uh, part of the illusion that is the manifest world. Um, so when Crowley's talking about that, he says, you know, so it's, it's the combination of lingam and yoni, of life and death, of the absolute and the conditioned, the things that normally, by definition, exclude each other by bringing them together. He comes into this, and this draws very heavily on Hegel's philosophy of. Um, uh, his idea of progress being um, a synthesis of thesis and antithesis, and that's that's some of the most basic stuff about Hegel. I, Hegel's kind of hard to read, but at the same time, um, I do. I, I think it's worth taking your time and going through him. Basically, it's I, it's not the kind of he doesn't have the kind of writing that you would expect to go through. You know, it's not, you know, it's not page turning material necessarily, but the, I think that uh, that can frustrate people because they can feel like they're reading the same book forever and it's taking a really long time or whatever. But you're really supposed to take a long time when you're reading stuff like this. Like a page should take a long time if you want to take the time and actually digest what's being said. Um, you can't expect it to flow like a, like a detective story or something like that. Um, the other philosopher that um, Crowley is drawing heavily on here is uh, Spinoza, although he's less likely to credit Spinoza. Um, he doesn't talk about it very much. I like. It could just be because I've particularly studied Spinoza, so I maybe tend to see those ideas there. But uh, his idea, Spinoza's idea of the substance uh, that exists, sort of as a preliminary condition to all things, uh, is very similar to Crowley's uh, experience of or, or description of uh, that as a thing. And you can kind of see that in Spinoza's Ethics Demonstrated in a Geometrical Order, which again uh, can take a while to read, but. It's actually le less difficult. It is time consuming, but uh, Spinoza is a very clear writer. He kind of references, every time he makes a major point, he has like a, a number or letter that expresses that point. So when he refers back to that point, he will cite the number or letter so you can turn back and see, okay, you know, he's saying this and this, and he's basing it on this, this, and this. So from the perspective of someone looking at it, just being able to understand formal logic, it's pretty easy to like see the progression of his arguments and uh, you know, take them at their own value. I mean, personally to me, I think Spinoza has the best uh, demonstrable um, argument for the existence of God that's sort of been out there that I've seen. I mean, I don't think Aquinas' argument is that good. I don't think a lot of the other Christian philosophers have really strong arguments, but I find it difficult to argue, at least logically, with what Spinoza is sort of saying there. Um, and this is important, too, to understand this role of that, because um, being the precursor to the Naples arrangement of the Tree of Life, that's kind of something that, as ceremonial magicians, 